and welcome everyone to another lecture in our uh, Toronto Italian Comics Studies series. I'm very happy to welcome again Marco Arnaudo, who in fact uh, was a, a keynote speaker on comics uh, at a uh, conference organized by our graduate students a few years ago, pre-pandemic. Now everything is, you know, it's either uh, a, a BP or AP before or after a pandemic. Um, but it's great to have him virtually here. Uh, hopefully, we couldn't ask him to bring all his uh, games to uh, to Toronto. Right? Um, the this is, as I mentioned, it's a Goja lecture, but it's also co-sponsored by the uh, uh, Toronto Italian uh, Comic Studies Group, which is a group that has been active for about a year that is trying to uh, uh, get some initiative around. The still fairly understudied genre or medium, uh, that's something for discussion, of, uh, uh, of comics, uh, kind of building some, um, some work around, uh, around that, but also some, you know, some, some uh, networking uh, among the people that uh, work on comics uh, uh, all over the world, which is why uh, we also like to do these things on, uh, online. It just makes it easier to connect to other uh, to other um, researchers, I um, uh, 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 this is a um, this group, the study group, it brings together faculty members, graduate students, postdocs, um, and uh, so I would like to uh, let uh, Alessio Aleta, who's uh, uh, one of the founding members, so to speak, of the study group introduce uh, uh, Professor Arnaldo Alessio is one of our uh, uh, one of our graduate students. So Alessio, over to you and then on to the main event. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, so, uh, yeah, as a founding member of the TICS, Toronto Italian Comic Studies, it is my honor uh, to introduce Professor Marco Arnaudo. Marco Arnaudo is a professor in the Department of French and Italian at Indiana University Bloomington. His research focuses on a range of topics from Italian culture of the Baroque period to gaming culture and comic studies. Uh, his publications include the volume on the influence of Dante's Divine Comedy on early modern Italian literature, a book about storytelling in games, a book about superhero comics, a modern edition of the, of the 17th uh, century erotic comedy Il Natale di Amore, The Birth of Love, by Giulio Strozzi, and a study on Baroque religious poetry. At the present time, he is working on a study of enigmatology in the Italian Renaissance. And today he will present uh, a lecture titled Comics and Games in Italy, The Quest for the Playable Story. Professor Arnaudo, to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me uh, and for allowing me to talk about two of my favorite topics, comics and games. When I don't know which one to choose, then I come up with a talk such as um, I'll start by sharing a slideshow with you. Um, starting, okay, here we go, slideshow. Here we go. Games and comics in Italy. So, um, Thinking about how games can tell stories and how comics can become games is part of a broader research project and interest of mine that has been going on for a couple of years now. This is my book from 2018, Games That Tell Stories. And I still use the framework that I presented there anytime that they talk about games and stories, such as today, comics that become games. The reason is this, uh, there had been a couple of a, a number of studies earlier discussing whether or not games can tell stories. But one problem is that uh, scholars had not really defined what they meant by story, which led to very inconsistent conversations. So in my book, I started from narratology and I presented a model, a list of traits that if a game has, chances are that the game will be perceived as a story. Incidentally, the reason why I wrote this book and what because I felt that there was indeed a trend of games that were telling stories. I just realized reviewers of games so were talking about spoilers, which don't didn't make sense really. Oh, okay, I'll tell you about this game in detail. I'm not going to spoil the story for you. Um, 
I realized the reviewers and players were talking about stories. So I asked myself, how can a game tell a story and which games do tell a story? For a game to tell a story and therefore for a game to portray a comic book in a way that feels like a story, a couple of things, in my opinion, are necessary. The game must have a theme that is a fictional represented topic. A lot of games from history are completely abstract. There is no theme. Checkers has no theme, for example. Um, that the, the theme, however, must also be represented in some detail. It's not enough to just paste it on. If I take checkers and I use little plastic tanks instead of the usual game pieces, it doesn't become a tank battle because the, the, the game doesn't have enough detail there. Which leads me to the main point, the ne next point, the theme must be connected with the mechanics. Again, if I have tanks in a checkers game, that's not how tanks usually defeat each other, by leapfrogging each other. Fiction also thrives on individual characters. Usually that's, we, we, we think of the protagonist, co-protagonist, antagonist, and so forth. Traditional games don't have that. Where is the individual character in Go? And these characters evolve over the story. You can think of the queen and the king in chess as characters, but you don't have them go through a personal journey. They're on or off on the board. The way in which things happen in fiction, there's a causal connection. Things tend to uh, be caused one from the other. Avant-garde fiction breaks that, but precisely that's why we feel of it as avant-garde. We still feel that as a detour from the standard idea in which there is a connection. Finally, most games will present all of their information at the very beginning, and then it's about permuting that information. As opposed to when you pick up a novel, you open the first page, you don't know and everything that's gonna happen. The content is revealed gradually, progressively by a story. As opposed to, again, I look at the chessboard, well, that's there's never gonna be a third army that comes out of nowhere. But I open the first page of a Game of Thrones, by which I mean the first book of A Song of Ice and Fire, I don't know who's gonna be there. So these are some of the traits that traditionally pertained only to stories that in the last couple of decades have been implanted more and more often into gaming. When we talk about games and uh, comic books in particular, we, you will see many examples today of paratextual games, by which I mean games that have the traits that I showed you earlier, they are creating a story, but they don't create their own story world. They implant their gameplay onto pre-existing story worlds. These are two of the founding texts of the thinking about the paratextual game, paratextual precise meaning games that come from text and that surround text, that are around text, interacting with Babylon 5 and then pull both gameplay. So as you will see, the idea is we take a game, we give it the narrative components that I explained earlier, while at the same time trying to bring to life in an interactive way a comic, a pre-existing text. But before I talk about that, I want to give you some interesting antecedents, so maybe a borderline of a way in which images can tell stories and become part of a narrative. And we had to go back all the way to the Renaissance. Before I talk about that, I'd like to talk about the modern precedent of the tarot cards that emerged in Italy in the 14th and 15th century. They uh, were popular among the courts of Northern Italy. And they had four suits, 14 cards per suit, 10 numbers for uh, 10 numbers of four cards per suit. But most importantly, what immediately captured the imagination of players of the time were the 21 so-called triumphs plus a wild card, kind of like a wild card called the matto. Everybody has seen them in some form. These cards are often when we think of the tarots, we don't so much think about the two of cups. We think about justice, death, the wheel, the tower, etc., etc. The immense iconic power of these images was evident from the very beginning. So much so that for as long as we have had the tarots, they have been used for two main purposes at the beginning. 
which was games, capture games, in which you're only looking at the relative value of the cards. A two can capture this one, the matto can capture that one, but also created games, storytelling games, in which players will combine these images to create stories. There is, of course, a third, a third use that of divination, but that's much later. That only emerges in the 18th century. No one thought at the time of the Italian Renaissance that you could read the future using cards. But they thought that you can create literature and you can create an interesting relations between images that become part of a partially verbal communication. For example, Boyardo, more known for his epic poetry, also wrote a series of short poems or tercets meant to go on the images of a tarot deck. Again, these are not poetry about a game. This is poetry for a game, to be part of a verbal game. So then now these become, well, proto-comics or definitely emblems or definitely more similar to uh, speaking, talking allegories. So much so that some of the suits, uh, they're modified. So basically on one hand, these are written for the tarot, but at the same time, you will need to tweak the tarots for these terses to go on. So that's an interesting intersection to me from the very beginning of gameplay, of creating narrative content and having images and words interacting. And at the same time, again, in the 1500s, we know that those cards, as I said, were used for creative games so that people would uh, random pull a number of cards and then create a story based on it and then create a poem based on it. We don't need to read this poem by full language in detail. It's most important for my, po for my purpose to show you that this, that this exists, that it was a a game that was played around the courts of Italy to create texts surrounding permutations of images. Aretino wrote a dialogue called Le Carte Parlanti, the talking cards. If you're thinking about images, about comics, that's images that talk, there's a pretty impressive uh, antecedent of that idea. In this dialogue, fascinating, Aretino says in the dialogue, I don't play tarot cards, I just collect them, which is fascinating for those of us who buy a lot of games and then people ask you, did you play them all? And well, Aretino didn't feel guilty, so I'm not going to feel guilty either. So Aretino says, I just like to look at them. They're so beautiful. And the premise of this dialogue is that at some point, the cards start talking to him. It's a dialogue between Aretino and a deck of cards. So yeah, these cards sure can create content. Sure, there are images that talk because within the fiction of this really bizarre work, the cards, the, the heavily illustrated cards become an interlocutor with Aretino. The, the, the dialogue as for the content explains what he believes to be the allegorical meaning of the triumphs. And also it's fascinating because uh, there's also, so he also talks about some practical meanings. He believes, for example, that the cards can be used as a training for warfare, the idea of reading someone else's uh, intentions based on what they play, figuring out what they have. And I mention like that because it's stunning because it's like 400 years before Clausewitz came up with the same idea that the closest activity uh, to war in the human world is playing cards. Tasso wrote about cards also, not one dialogue, but two. He wrote the little mail and then he wasn't satisfied and he wrote a bigger, longer one. In this, he picks up most of the points uh, from Tasso. What is fascinating is you jump ahead a couple of centuries and now you have Calvino in the castle of the Cronestinis, in which he's basically playing the same game that people were already playing. Uh, from the introduction to that book, I'm, I'm not sure that Calvino was aware of the fact that there was a precedent. I think he's going to say, I'm coming up with this crazy idea, I'm playing it with him. It is interesting that they both Folengo and the courtiers of the Renaissance and Calvino came up with the idea that you can combine and connect these images and create stories. Matter of fact, if you read The Castle of the Cross Destinies, you will see the text and printed on the side, there are the images of the tarots that have inspired those elements. 
and the text constantly switches, says, oh, I saw that car, the car represents this, the car represents that. The fiction is it's a group of people that get together in this castle and somehow they can't, they lost the use of the spoken word and they're using these cards to create stories. And again, if you look at the way it works, so the, the printed page is in the castle across destinies, you almost have a comic book like kind of thinking, if nothing else, that's going to switching back and forth between a visual element and a verbal element. So these are to me some fascinating, interesting ideas of how words, images, and games already intersected back in the day. When we get to the present, we need to take a short detour because we need to, I need to give you a short intro for those who may not be aware of how did games start to tell stories all of a sudden again? Because they were doing so in the Renaissance, then it appears that the tradition went away uh, because it was a thing of the courts, so probably died out together with the courtly culture of the time, but it was reinvented out of the blue in the Midwest in the 1970s by a group of war gamers of, of the Midwest, some in the Twin Cities, some in Michigan. They invented this new style of game called role-playing games, which have all of the elements that they told you earlier. They have a consistent world. There is a story world. There is a setting. Players take on the role of individual characters. And these characters uh, are part of story-driven adventures. In particular, there is an omnipotent referee who is a sort of narrator. If you haven't played those games, the idea is that you will describe the action that your character attempts to take. I'm going to try to open the door. I'm going to try to climb that tree. And the narrator will use both their personal judgment and game mechanics to tell you the outcome. And so literally narrating an event is a move, is a move in the game, is an in-game action. So... When games became like that, again, games undoubtedly became a form of storytelling. Well, at least a traditional games emerged in which games could tell stories. Again, it was in the twin cities of the 60s and early 70s that they started having these elements using a referee that increasingly became a storyteller or a co-storyteller. War games had been about uh, large armies before, as you can see from this picture. Was, this used to be the standard. War games used to be about toy soldiers. Role-playing games, uh, when these war games became about individual figurines, became man-to-man -man combat, then the potential for games about individuals emerged. Therefore, the potential for stories emerged because, again, most storytelling in history is about individual human beings, not about large amorphous masses of people. And these gamers started playing war games set first in Napoleonic times, then in the Middle Ages. The 60s and the 70s, it was also the time where uh, The Lord of the Rings was becoming popular in the US. Came out in England in the 1950s. First American editions were very expensive. Then some pirated editions started coming out. And as a response, then the Tolkien estate authorized cheap paperbacks to be published in the U.S. So that's in the late 60s that, although it has been on the bookshelves for a while, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and fantasy became a big presence. And now you have these people playing fan, playing medieval, man-to-man -man combat war games with a story-driven element. The appeal of fantasy sneaks in, and before you know it, People are playing games about fantasy heroes in a fantasy universe. The guy who came up really with the idea was this man here, Dave Arneson. In the early 1970s, he started running story-driven fantasy campaigns in which I'd be an elf and Luca would be a, a hobbit. They called them hobbits in the, in the 70s. Then they got a letter and they had to call them halflings. And Luca is a halfling bard and so on and so forth. Dave Arneson came up with this idea. He was a storyteller. People loved it. However, he didn't have a lot of editorial skills or business skills and management skills. And there was another game, game designer, Gary Gygax in Michigan, who had similar ideas. And, and basically, the two got together. And Gygax helped give shape, editorial form, 
to uh, Dave Arneson's ideas. And that's how in 1974, the first edition of D&D came out, which was not a game. It was still so deeply rooted in war game. It really was an expansion for war games. You say, if you're playing a war game, with your know, toy soldiers, if you want to add fantasy elements and have more of a story, you add this. But the idea that games could tell stories were immensely popular right away. However, and here we get to how this reconnects to what we need to talk about. The logistics of play were always very demanding from the very beginning. If you play one of these games, it takes preparations. The game master needs to very often prepare an adventure in advance. The sessions of play can be very long, uh, four or five hours. And it's important to try to have the same people. If half of your group bails out at the last minute. If it's a board game night, we play another game. But you can't really or necessarily play role-playing games. The logistics of play are demanding to this day. Imagine back in the day where you may have been the only person who knows about role-playing games in your small town in, in, in the Midwest. Um, so what happens? What, why is this important? Because from the very beginning, almost as early as role playing is a way of playing a similar kind of experience in a more accessible way. For example, Dave Arneson was running these campaigns and his friends were like crazy about it. They would call him at home and he was directing games on the phone because his friends didn't have, couldn't have they never have enough. Um, and so from the beginning, his friends were figuring out a way to play Dave's game. That's how they called it before it was D&D. One of his friends, Dave McGarry, in 1972, creates a board game version. So it's not as good as Dave's game, but it's kind of the idea that you're exploring. You have a hero, fight monsters, loot treasures, uh, you know, dodge traps. And this game, Dungeon, was created in 1972. It is actually older than Dungeons & Dragons. Although it was published in 75 due to the success of Dungeons and Dragons. I'm just telling you that attempt to play a role-playing game adventure in board game format is as old as role-playing, which is important because it just means now I don't have to prepare and study. I just take out the box. Everything is in there. From the very beginning, another way was attempted to play role-playing games alone, which is the game book. What you see on the left, the strategic review was a fanzine um, edited by Gary Gygax, so co-creator of Dungeons and & Dragons. And the first issue that you see the first page here had a section called Solo Dungeon Adventures. And he says, so many people ask us, can I play this game solo when my friends are not around? This is 70, 75. When you have the original game, people already demand it's great, but I don't get to play it often enough. And so what you have is a modular system. You have event tables, you roll on those tables and tells you that's the shape of the room that you're finding, roll on another table, that's the monster, roll on another table, there's a trap or not, roll, roll on another table, how much treasure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is basically modular dungeon generator. 1976, on the left, on the right, you have Buffalo Castle, the first game book. It was an expansion for the second role-playing game, which was Tannas and Trolls. Yes, Tannas and Trolls came out a year after Dungeons and Dragons. I know it kind of sounds similar, not a coincidence. Um, but the, the editor of Tannas and Trolls thought like, yeah, there are a lot of people who like to play this game alone, and they started creating solo adventures. This time, the meta was not modular, like solo dungeon adventures, it was game book meaning a branching story of the kind that you have. We choose your adventure books. To this day, they are the most iconic expressions of that kind of thing. Choose your adventure books. Of course, you only make decisions within the text. A game book proper, such as Buffalo Castle, based on TNT, also includes game mechanics. So you decide how you navigate the branching text, but you also roll dice and keep track of equipment. And you're playing a role-playing game, legit alone. Why is this important? Because in the 1970s, in the US, which is important, three ways emerged in which a game could tell a story, in which you could play interactive fiction. Open games. And that triggered immediately two other ways. Narrative board games, such as Dungeon, 
and game books, such as Buffalo Castle. Now, games and stories had a previous connection, which is not exactly, it's a precedent, but not a source, because loosely paratextual games had already existed. Uh, you already had games based on famous books, on uh, famous comics, not so much on famous movies. That really takes about the age of television to become a thing. Um, but early board games uh, about comic books, they date to the 1910s, almost as old as, as comics. But why do I say about? Because these were cases of the theme being pasted on. Perfectly abstract games that repurpose the art of a famous comic without giving you the flavor, the sense, the story, the feel for the comic. So what we have here is American sources, role-playing games being American sources uh, that Italians became passionate about early on. But at this point of another trend of research of mine, they're called Remade in Italy. Everybody knows Made in Italy, but I'm fascinated by all of the times in which Italian creators take something that is obviously Anglo-Saxon and remake it sometimes uh, in a sort of like ancillary and kind of like very uh, obvious way and some of the times more creative. So, for example, role-playing games, as we said, is one way in which games can tell stories. From the very beginning, they showed the struggle. The earliest Italian role-playing game is I Signori del Caos, the Lord of Chaos. You see the cover here on the left, uh, which was a fairly embarrassing uh, plagiarism slash translation of, of Dungeons and Dragons. It's just so heavily inspired by it. It's just trying to uh, cash in on that. What is fascinating, however, starting in 1984, you have two other designers, so the Carocci and, and, and Senzacqua, who decide instead to have not just a role-playing game written by Italians, but about Italian topics. And they use Italian lore and folklore and traditions as, uh, as the basis. So the story world is not a fantasy version of Anglo-Saxon lore, like Dungeons and Dragons and I Signori del Caos, but it's a fantasy Italy and so the map looks like a messed up version of Italy. You have cities that have the anagrams, the, the anagrams of Italian cities. Roma becomes Malo, for example, which has a weird, surreal feel. Everything is both recognizable as, as Italian and also uh, weird and surreal. It has a more, uh, it's a more ironic tone as opposed to high heroism of fantasy. So this is a good example of how there is a struggle very often in Italy between uh, foreign influences in an attempt to remake someone else's ideas in your own way. Incidentally, it is in this year that we have an interesting and early intersection of comics and role-playing games, because one of the earliest role-playing games, 1986, the first edition, which was you know low production values, then 1989, the deluxe edition that you see here, Holmes & Co., is one of the first uh, um, mystery role-playing games written by Italians set in the world of American fiction. So it's the hard boils, it's the Agatha Christie kind of murder. But at the same time, very innovative because at that time, role-playing games in the US were based on combat and action. This is possibly the first role-playing that I know in which you don't, you don't get to beat up anybody. In which you can have, there are options but you can solve a case if it's an Agatha Christie style without uh, any violence. And what fascinates me, as you can see from the cover, they hired Vittorio Giardino, one of the superstars of Italian comics, to illustrate both the cover and also the illustrations inside. So that's an, uh, that's an interesting intersection. That book is part of my collection and a much very treasured uh, possession of mine. The one I, I, I put on the side, the Cavalier del Tempi, I mentioned it more again to show how the pendulum keeps switching back and forth from a plagiarism of Dungeons and Dragons and then Mediterranean vernacular games, then Anglo-Saxon mystery, but with an iconic Italian comic book, and then an attempt again to go into European European history with the Cavalier del Tempio, which is 
uh, low fantasy inspired by European Middle Ages. And then we get, of course, to when Italian comics became the subject of Italian role-playing games. Dylan Dog was the first one. And it's understandable because it was the 1990s. Dylan Dog, the Dylan Dog mania was in full swing. Everybody was obsessed with that comics. The editor Sergio Bonelli overnight found himself being a major publisher from you know a, a secondary publisher of beloved Western comics. All of a sudden, they're a massive cultural powerhouse. And so you had to have everything that everything that you could put Dylan Dog on, you would do it. Stickers, anything. They just tried to sell the Dylan Dog brand everywhere. And when it comes to role-playing games, incident, interesting enough, they actually tried to go into some detail. The honest, I was 16 or 17. If you just give me a piece of paper with Dylan Dog printed on and say role-playing game, I would have bought that. So in retrospect, I'm happy actually they put some word because I would have bought anything that had Dylan Dog on it. And I know I wasn't the only one. But actually they put some work. He's very detailed. By today's standards, even too much. It feels a little fiddly. It feels a little cumbersome. And there's a lot of crunchy numbers. Maybe involuntarily, uh, they render some of the weird ambiguity of Dylan Dog and Italian comics uh, set in London, mainly, written by a writer who has never been to London and brags about it. And especially the early comics were full of interesting inconsistencies. And so those pubs really look like Osteria di Paese rather than anything that was properly Anglo-Saxon. And the Gioco di Ruolo di Dylan Dog there are some some of these weird inconsistencies. It's said to be in England, but for example, again, it's very detailed. For example, you need to roll your level of education to the point whether you started high school and finished it or started and dropped out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you went to high school, it's said in this game, then you had to choose if you went to a high school that specialized in humanities, science and technique, in techniques, or uh, artistic pursuits, which is the structure of Italian high schools. And so that's kind of like interesting. Again, you have that interference between Italian models and Anglo-Saxon models. One of the stories, Un Lupo Manado Italiano a Londra, an Italian werewolf in London, uh, which is very meta. It takes a movie, but, it's, but it puts a guy called Italo who lives in London and was irradiated and became a werewolf. It's also fascinating that in the Gioco di Rolo di Landog, you don't get to be the iconic detective Landog, nor one of his uh, major characters. You're all these other characters, you interact with them. It sort of keeps that uh, the lure, that mystique that can be disappointing, but also no. I remember playing this as a teenager and I didn't want to be Dylan Dog. I thought if any of my friends would have been Dylan Dog, I would have been so mad. So I think that was probably a good choice. To, to to retain that mystic the, the mystical allure of the character greater than life. And this idea uh, was followed by some other applications, other attempts by Bonelli again, who that all of a sudden was be, became a major publisher to some of other franchises. For Nathan, ne Nathan Never, like we say there, you want to say Nathan Never in Italy, Nathan Never, uh, it applied a system of pre-existing role-playing game, Cyberpunk, which gives us, in, in turn, the first Italian science fiction game. Dylan Dog was the first Italian horror game. Martin Mister was another comic book that received a role-playing game treatment. But I have to tell you this, it was a moment. It was a fleeting meteor. It was not the start of a trend. And again, I see the connection precisely with the meteoric success of the Dylan Dog comic book in the 1990s. Again, we haven't had then, well, 10 years later, there was one about Julia, another great comic that came out around this time. There wasn't another role-playing game about these other things. It was a thing, and Bonelli hasn't invested in that field since. But again, it gives us fascinating firsts in the history of Italian role-playing games. Now we have possibly another interesting experiment when it comes to intersecting comic books and role-playing games. Matteo Casali and Federica Croci have produced, starting from 2022, Dakajar, which is 
both an original comic and a role-playing game. So it's not paratext or exact, it's pure, it's pure, it's pure transmedia, meaning a, a, a project that starts between two media to start with, rather than jumping from one to the other, that be intermedia. In Drakajar, well, you have a fantasy story, very Anglo-Saxon, very barbarian, very Conan the Barbarian, as you can see from the, from the limited amount of clothing on the cover, but the copious amount of blood. Um, so it's very Anglo-Saxon, no, no embarrassment about it, but each volume has both a story set in this fantasy brutal world, and then at the end, rules and material to use for a role-playing game set in that same world. And that's a very unusual, a very unusual solution to say the least. Now, comics and games also, or interactive activities, also have another interesting trend in Italy from the Storie a BV, uh, Stories by the Crossroads. These are interactive fiction of the kind of the choose your own adventure. And in this, I think, again, the Italians may first. I'm stud I've been studying game books for quite a while now. I, I think these are the first uh, uh, interactive comics. At least I don't know of any older interactive comics, bona fide interactive comics, in which you make decisions if Mickey Mouse does this and Mickey Mouse does that, and you go to different uh, narrative branches, they're very simple stories, typically with six endings. There's no identification. They're not role-playing games. You are not Mickey or you are not Goofy. Matter of fact, some of the decisions don't really pertain to any of the characters. You decide if ghosts exist, for example, and the story will reflect that. In that sense, choices do not necessarily co correspond to the character's actions. And the worlds are inconsistent. Depending on where you go, the stories may be incompatible with one another. The point I'm trying to say is that these stories are purely narrative. One doesn't really play to win a goal, to achieve an objective, but just for the joy of making decisions and see different silly situations. This was applied to 17 stories between 1985 and 1997. Not nothing, but not a lot either. It's about little more than one per year. Not much, but it becomes more interesting because again, we can say that that was I just mentioned, so like the first generation of crossroads stories, which are just about the joy of reading stories that change. But then we had another beautiful fleeting moment in the early 2000s, in which at Lino they decided to try to uh, rejuvenate, revamp the format, and it was done with. Be what I call be me gamified, meaning this was not stories that were just branching out in all directions. But from the very beginning, the character, the main protagonist, was trying to achieve a clear objective. In this story, which was the first, uh, Paperone, Uncle Scrooge, got locked out of his deposit and he's yeah. trying to figure out how to get in. And you, the reader, now you are given a task, yeah. you are given a job. So much so that you're told, <laughs> Rumi, can you mute yourself? I'll just keep going. Uh, speak louder. Uh, the idea is that now there is a game that you're trying to win, and you win by finding the one true ending, the one solution. The connection with games is so strong that actually you're told that there are levels. The more you advance, the more levels, like in a video game, you are you are completing. So much so, you know, so you can see what says, Sei pronto forza allora va al livello uno. Are you ready? Then let's go. Go to level one. So the section is called level one instead of page one. And again, in a certain sense, now we well activating the connection with, uh, with uh, video games. Now all of a sudden, the character you're controlling feels like an avatar. Uh, how long do I still have? I s just to get a sense. About five minutes. Five minutes, actually. So real quick, I'm gonna give an, I'm just gonna tell you that that was a last. There was a fleeting moment of several of these stories between 2000 and 2005, and then that disappeared. In recent times, we have more game books. I wanna go real quick to tell you that uh, 
when it comes to board games, remember the third way in which you can tell game, you can have a comic book that becomes a game that tells a story. Yes, we have had the pasted on. This game came out in 1994 because you could sell Dylan Dog in any way in 1994. And this game has nothing to do with Dylan Dog or anything. The, the mechanics are very abstract. And in 1991, you could sell Dylan Dog in any way. So now there is a deck of poker cards uh, with Dylan Dog on it. What is a little interesting here, though, is that they added a booklet with solo games you could play with those cards. And what is interesting is completely pretextuous uh, introduction, allegedly in the voice of Dylan Dog, who says, well, you don't know it, but when you're not following my adventures, dear readers, I like to play solitaire games with these cards, which is weird and gratuitous, but in a certain way is a sense of trying to make this deck of cards that, Dylan, that you buy, this deck of cards somewhat canon, somewhat part of the world of Dylan Dog. But I want to point out uh, real quick in the last couple of minutes how then in the last two decades, board games have become more thematic. And therefore, board games about comics have given the players more of a flavor and a sense of the story. An impressive connection, synergy between the means of the game and the means of comics is in the game Corto, inspired by Corto Maltese, Designed and produced in France, though, which tells you how popular these stories are internationally. And the game is played on these boards that are extraordinarily long and clearly simulate comic strip. Incidentally, you see three here, but there are more. The idea is you choose any three and you combine them so that your permutation is very strong there. There's also a particularly strong integration between the language of comic and the game functions. For example, if you can shoot once with this cannon, you will see boom once instead of cannon and the number one. The other kind, if you can shoot twice with this other card, the onomatopoeia, baratatatatrat, baratatatatrat, is two. So those that look like perfectly legit comic onomatopoeics also have a game function. The number of onomatopoeia tells you how many times you can use the game effect. If a certain character can be used by Corto or by Rasputin, as you can probably see here, it's in a thought balloon. So this character is loyal to Corto, and is represented by the fact that he's thinking about Corto. So there's a very, very unusual, there's a high degree of integration of language or comic within game functions. And finally, I'm talking about the thematic terms, games of the last decade or so based about some Italian comics and created by Italian designers in this kind. They have more detail, they have more theme, they have more characters. When you play Fino all'ultima Pallottola till the last bullet so by Tex, you do get the feel of a duel with one of the iconic uh, or the iconic Tex villains. And finally, and then gonna, I'm going to uh, be quiet until I get my until I get some questions. There's an example, the perfect exemplification of thematic turn games about comics. They really try to capture the feel of the comics. This is the one that does the best, in my opinion, diabolic heists and investigations. Essentially, it's in English. The other games are available in English also. That is to say, now these games also have an international market which may or may not be aware of the comics. But what's fascinating is that here you really have a game that captures the spirit and flavor of the comics. One player team will control Diabolic and Eva as they go around and complete secret heists. The game pieces are not on the board. Uh, what you see, the game pieces there is like the detectives are trying to guess what Diabolic might be. And so that just represents the guesses. In truth, the actual location is hidden on cards. The other says, okay, I'm going to that city. Then you come meet with that car, but the piece is not physically there. So it's very reminiscent of the comics in which the, the cops are trying to figure out what Diabolic is. Diabolic is sneaking around from time to time. He's sighted. Then he jumps on his Jaguar and for a turn, he can move fast, but he's visible until he tries to disappear again. Eva is somewhere else trying to distract the cops. Is it's a legit, excellent game if you like hidden movement games. And it's just a stunning way in which you can render the story world of a comics 
through the affordances of gaming in a way that were just not present in early games that I mentioned before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Arnaudo, for this uh, fascinating lecture. We can now open the Q&A. Uh, I would like to invite the participants either by um, to ask questions either by raising uh, your hand in the function raise hand or write them in the chat. Professor Somigli. Oh, actually, no, let's have, uh, this is some, let's have Sara ask her question first, I. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, to see you again, Professor Arnaudo. And this is my question, because you talk about uh, tax, and, you know, I'm a huge fan of tax. So I was thinking, like, nowadays, with all, like, the policy about the, you know, the um, um, the interdisciplinarity, about the racism and the fact towards like a First Nation people. You see like, you know, a game like a, like a, the one you presented on tax is, is, a, is um, you can use it in class or, I mean, can create some debate, can be difficult to use tax in class nowadays or not? Well, I haven't tried to play it in class because it just didn't happen to intersect any of my of the class as was teaching. Uh, the problem that I may have there is more about gunplay. Is about it is a gun duel. So uh, in the U.S., I'd be more worried about normalizing shooting people. Um, and in particular, none of that background, which is debatable about the. Uh, about the white supremacy of the Western genre in general. None of that is portrayed here. Now, we know the text, of course, was created in 1948 after Italy had just lost its colonies and everybody knew how what a bad and horrible idea that had been. Almost everybody, almost everybody. <laughs> My point is that in 1948, text writing these open spaces was more about freedom and about adventure than it was about colonialism. It was not part of the Italian debate or dream. But of course, if you if you if you translate those same stories in the U.S., that would have had another meaning. So, in its original context, in the eyes of the creators and the original and the original readers, I do not think it had that connotation. Um, so my idea is that when it comes to classroom, of course, I do present controversial topics, and I think it's probably one of my obligations to, to do so. And everything has worked when I present a controversial topic as long as I frame them as such. They say we're looking at the cultural artifact. We are looking at uh, science fiction from the 1930s, which is steeped in the systemic racism at the time. Remember, that is a society where lynchings were common, so the South had Jim Crow, the North had sundown towns. So what kind of science fiction do you think a white person growing up in the fully segregated American expected? When people read this kind of thing that horrifies us, which is good that it does, that was perfectly average. So actually, I like to look at bias and racism and controversial topics, particularly in mass culture. Then the, that you cannot have the excuse of the few rotten apples. If that was the mass culture, if that was popular, that was the default, that was mainstream, that didn't raise an eyebrow. So my point is that I don't know how that would work in a classroom, that'll be up to whoever, the, the comfort of the teacher. Um, if it's about text, meaning a history of uh, Western comics in Italy, I did that, actually we didn't play this game, but I had my student read some text stories and Magico Vento and Zago, and we had these conversations and students saw these as cultural artifacts that had one meaning in Italy and could have a different one in the U.S. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Sara. Uh, Professor Somili, if you had a question. Yeah, sure. I just, I'll, I'll refrain my, uh, you know, instinct to, to, to reminisce and, you know, it was like 
going down memory lane with seeing the old the Dungeons and Dragons covers and so on and so forth. Um, I have had another question. The one question that kind of uh, fascinated me is the is the 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 issue translation. Um, you said that a lot of these games are available in English. One thing that surprised me, I was in Italy for a few months um, last semester, and uh, I was astounded by how many games are translated into uh, into uh, uh, Italian. Um, uh, mm -hmm. You know, considering it's it's a you know, big market, but not that big. That <laughs> is um, So I'm just wondering... So the comics connection is obviously helps, uh, right? Um, I'm wondering how much cinema can help, especially the mediation from um, Italy to North America. The Diabolic has had some adaptations, for instance, um, so that it mm -hmm. it can be anchored to something that perhaps text cannot. Where you know it, text is is a very Italian phenomenon has, and has never made that leap to other media and certainly and 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 uh, in in ways that could that uh, american audiences could be receptive to it so i'm just wondering if yeah if if cinema has also been a factor in the in 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 providing a further vehicle for some of these uh, of, of these narratives uh, and and these games. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. what is the, the the North American audience for a book for a game like Diabolic, um, mm -hmm. as opposed well, to you know. one thing is that yeah, Diabolic just because of the of the Bava movie, that the iconic movie, uh, has some currency in North America in the U.S. Not my students, but people my age who has never read Diabolic, they remember the movie, and when I show it to my students, they still love it. Because they're like, this is like, whoa. This it's an amazing is, film. Like, yeah. yeah. Right. They, they still love it. Um, this game has been is done pretty well in the US. It has good ratings, and you see reviews by people, by American players who have never watched the movie, but they just played the a game. So they miss that paratextual element that we know, but the game happens to be good. Other games such as Zago or Disamericana, that really is more in trouble if you have the nostalgia factor and you're reliving the story, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an interesting thing uh, that if you have a good paratextual game, it can be appreciated by multiple audiences. The people who understand the references will appreciate the most, but other people may still enjoy enough for that game to be produced and reprinted and, and remade. Um, and I would say that what you say about cinema may help, but I think when it comes to Diabolic or this one, I think it has a limited, very limited. Ultimately, I think the game culture these days is so strong. There's such a strong interconnection of reviewers and audiences and Kickstarter and game found and crowdfunding that I think a game about an Italian comic may make it to the US and internationally, even when it loses its connection to its sources in the eyes of many of its uh, of its players. Thank and you. Again, and it's just, I don't see that there isn't been an impact to see movies about Italian comics uh, made internationally and then becoming a, a, a big, a big thing. Mm -hmm. Zagor, for example, now there is a, uh, Zagor has been direct English editions, American editions by Epicenter. I wrote the introduction uh, the American edition of Odyssey Americana, because that is, you know, a relevant text to me. And that's that's one that's always been special to me. Uh, so some of these stories, uh, when it comes to Weird West, uh, like Zagor, some of the most the progressive things, uh, they do not clash with American values in a way that makes them impossible to be translated. Even some of the text stories like Patagonia, where he goes and helps the rebels down in Patagonia. That has been translated into English, for example. But I do not know that people would pick up a board game based on this one graphic novel that they may or may not have read. Yeah, no, I think that's more about contextualizing, you know, Italian comics mm -hmm. for a North American context where, you know, the 
uh, yeah, the, the the context for understanding how certain you know tropes and themes and so on have been reworked. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, I, I mean, the first um, revisionist Western I've ever read is you know Tex uh, uh, Sanguinava, which is you know 1965. I want to say. Oh well, yeah. Well before you know revisionist Western, but mm-hmm. that gets lost in, in, to uh, uh, in. You know, the yes. way of other other uh, text stories. Yeah, you so. had this weird paradox. Very often, you know, the the pioneer's paradox. If you translate the story now, of course, it may look racist by today's standards. But then mm-hmm. you're right. This is 1965. Look what happened in the U.S. It's way ahead of its time. Right. While it was progressive by the standards, and that's why I. That's the kind of conversation I have with my students all the time. Uh, I'm with you all. It's fine to apply today's standards, but also we need to add the historical understanding of what that that may have been different at the time. Mm-hmm. And again, when it comes to diabolic, they may have lost all of the, you know, diabolic have been being created for workers, for factory workers that were taking the train in the morning and they were picking up diabolic and they saw this guy who stole from aristocrats. So you have these people that work very hard and they love the idea diabolic sticks it to the man and, you know, and kills and murders rich people who never worked a day in their life. All that social thing is completely lost. If you haven't read this and then you pick up this one, then you are a badass super super criminal doing mm-hmm. heist. It's pretty fun. <laughs> Even if you don't know about again the resentful Italian factory workers being the original audience for Diabolic in the eyes of the of the creators, that said they were inspired by seeing these depressed uh, factory workers mm-hmm. lined up for the train in the morning, and, and created by two women, no less, in a, in an no in industry that was, you know, notably was. not exact notable for its uh, diversity. No, of course not. At, at the time, that was yeah, yeah. exceptional that you had these two women at the helm. And even for a long time, women have had have been uh, relegated to secondary roles in Italian comics. Only recently, we started having more variety. But the fact that yeah, yeah. we have two of the most important Italian authors of all time being these two women, these two sisters, that's, mm-hmm. that's pretty awesome. And that's why from the very beginning, Diabolic and Eva, it was always a partnership. She... If Eva was introduced in episode three of Diabolic, where she saves his life, she falls in love with him and he's scheduled to be beheaded at the guillotine. And she's the one who helps him escape and immediately becomes the partner. So from the very beginning, she was no damsel in distress. Mm-hmm. Yes, when I play Diabolic, I always want to play Eva. So that full, full disclosure. <laughs> if, we play, if you're together, don't even think about it. I play Eva because she's too awesome. <laughs> Alice. Yeah, so I had the question about um, those two games after the uh, D&D copycat that mm-hmm. tried to repurpose those mechanics but in an Italian setting. Uh, I find it very interesting because like, basically all of the Italian comic hits are set somewhere else, typically in America, like Tex Wheeler is in America and Dylan Dog is in London, Corto Maltese is all around the world. Uh, and even to these days, I can't think of a real, you know, uh, Italian comics set in Italy that is, you know, hugely popular. Mm-hmm. Uh, even even Italian fantasy often has a, you know, uh, an imagery that is not typically Italian. So how do you explain this attempt to like, you know, uh, repurpose those kind of imagery to an Italian setting? Mm-hmm. Well, I think they're particularly courageous and brave. Precisely because the trend has been, oh, well, if we make in American Western in Italy, you achieve high quality and that's the best you can do. That's not bad. That's why I don't have anything against the idea of proper or remade in Italy of Tex Wheeler or of the most popular game, the most popular board games about the Lord of the Rings is called War of the Ring. The designer are Marco Maggi, Francesco Nepitello, and Roberto Di Meglio. These two Italian guys are considered the best designers in the world of games about Tolkien. So the fact that we're good and respected and known for this talent of taking Anglo-Saxon topics and make it even more enjoyable, that's not bad. That's a good starting point. 
it becomes even more interesting and brave when you start having designers that go against that mold. And so, for example, uh, Catacumbas being, again, about uh, Italian-based fantasy. And when you start looking into it, there is a lot of stuff. You do have uh, Ariosto and Boyardo, and you do have folk tales, and you do have Calvino and the Fiabe Italiane, and you do have uh, um, um, La Mata Blanca Leone. You do have a lot of comic elements. Actually, if you give me a second, I'll be right back because I want to show you something. I can find it. So it started with Italians asserting themselves as we're going to make English based stuff, make it our own, which may just be about why don't we enter a market? But after a while, it becomes a matter of pride and creativity. And some of these things are very good. And they start saying, but why don't we then fill the market with a new, with new content? Because once you latch onto the Anglo-Saxon world, your audience now is American players and English players. Then if you start doing the Italian stuff, you have a propositional value. It becomes more special. You're not another copycat. When the market starts being saturated like, oh, more elves, boom, you have Brancalonia instead. When you have every year Dungeons and Dragons expansions that are all the same or very similar, then you got a team of Italian designers led by Mario Longo who creates Brancalonia. Very similar to Catacumbas when it comes to the story world is this ironic, crazy, um, low-class, folksy fantasy with drunk paladins and clever friars and, and, and lewd nuns and et cetera and so forth. Um, but now with the setting, we using the rule, the rules of Dungeons and Dragons. And what is interesting, again, this is an English book, was on Kickstarter, and the English project was financed, therefore, was also financed by American players. Like, I had never seen a DD game quite like it. So that is pretty much how the story has gone. Italians overwhelmed by foreign models. First, they started doing a bit of copycats. It's near the cows. Then they started looking at local themes for local audience, catacumbas by Italians for Italians in the 1980s. With the modern interconnectedness, the fact that somebody can put a prod in Rome, can put on a project on Kickstarter that will be backed up by people in Ohio. Now the audience become world audience. And now having these Italian topics becomes a badge of originality and uniqueness. Or another special for Dungeons and Dragons, Inferno. Because, you know, as Italians, we like to go to hell in every possible way, video games, board games, game books, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's another way of going to Inferno. It's an expansion for Dungeons and Dragons set on Inferno. In the US, usually they read part of Inferno in high school. All of my high school, all of my college students have read some Dante. And now they latch onto something that they're familiar with, but it is also strange and new and original. And they have never played a Dungeons and Dragons uh, story with this, with this setting. So what I'm trying to say is that we started looking for our own stories to tell as Italians with a sense of inferiority. And now... 30 years later, his has turned into a center strength and has given us a, a value in the eyes of international audiences that no one could have imagined. But again, it took the inter-revolution. While Lex Arcana came out in the 1990s by Italians for Italians, 2018, it's an international sensation. At the Gen Con Fair 2018, it was a big thing that people wanted to play this game where it was a fantasy set in ancient Rome. Thank you for the question. I hope I, I answered this idea. We start from a sense of inferiority and become actually really cool and internationally famous for doing weird Italian stuff in English. And sometimes the English is a little bit weird also. And I think that just adds to the authenticity of the experience. Some of these English past like, eh, I can tell that that wasn't translated right. And I imagine if someone doesn't know Italian, they'll just get the flavor that it's even more special and international.
I think we have time just for this last question. Uh, so, uh, Q. Uh, thank you. Okay, can, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, first, thank you so much for your fascinating presentation. And shall I introduce a little bit myself? So I'm a PhD student of University of Padua. And my research project is about translation phenomenon of science Anglo-American science fiction in Italy. So my question is, okay, is the so, so is the science fiction elements, so sci-fi elements appears frequently in the Italian games and comics in this situation and how frequently they will exist and is there some kind of famous book that I can keep so take some notes about that's my question. When it comes when it comes to comics, the biggest Italian sci-fi comic is Nathan Never. Uh, came out in 1991, 1992. Uh, so it's pretty long lasting by now, has been a staple. And there wasn't really any Italian science fiction comic that popular, that massive. There were Disney Italia stories set in space, but you didn't have a serious that was that popular. So that is definitely the, I would say, backbone of Italian modern comic science fiction. And again, before then, you had some important famous stories, La Terra Contro Saturno and, and uh, Virus Il Mago della Festa Nera, stuff like that. But it wasn't uh, a regular thing. So yeah, I would definitely start from Nathan Nevin. Uh, don't, some Nathan Never stories have also been translated into English. So, yeah, there is a Dark Horse edition of several stories by Nathan Never with the, the covers being redrawn by an American artist to give it more of a, of a familiar look. So that could be interesting. You can see how those things have been maybe translated into English. Um, and when it comes to games, again, since uh, science fiction has not been the biggest genre in Italian comics, never was. Science fiction has not been the biggest genre in Italian uh, uh, writing, if nothing else, possibly one of the few that we're still struggling with. Even fantasy the last decade or so with Literature Easy, we started having Italian pop fantasy, but it's just not a big thing. Italians and science fiction, that's the one genre where we're still struggling. That's why I say Nada Never is the biggest output of Italian science fiction I can think of. You know, I can't imagine you think of like, oh, there is the big cycle of 15 super world famous science fiction novels written by Italians. I'm not aware that there's anything like that. It, it reminds a very minor. Ah, very good. The gun is all funny. Good. Thank you I for. Have, uh, yes. Next, yes. I have next. Yes. No, no. Yeah. Next to Nathan Never, there would be another one. Of course, again, much more limited in time. Yes. That's a good example. But Thank again, you so much. It's, uh, there are just so many more. Else, think about France, you're going to struggle to think of French sci fi. And it's, so it's not even just an Anglo Saxon thing. We're just not, we're struggling with that. And of Thank course, of course, so that Yes. Recchioni and Nathan Never, I mean, Orphan and Nathan Never, you see, it's still very Anglo Saxon, written by Italian. It's still at the remade in Italy phase. Do we have. Can we have science fiction set in Italy in the year 2200? I think that'd be, I like to read that. I don't want to write that. Uh, right? You oh. see, the Never and Orphany are still very Anglo Saxon in that. Uh, there's another one, of course, there's another series, the one setting up, I don't mean to call the Another Bonelli story setting a sort of post apocalyptic world in the sense of science fiction. Brad Barron, Brad Barron. But again, it was like 18, 24 things. That was a limited series. In, in, yeah. In, in, yeah. It was one of the longest limited, maybe one yeah. like four or something, but still. Gregory so, Hunter, they tried a couple of, they've tried 20 years ago, Gregory Hunter, no success whatsoever. So it is science fiction of all pop genres, the one that in Italy, I believe, well, one of the least currency when created by Italians. Yeah, we're still back at the uh, the 
un disco volante non può tirare a Lucca a Lucca mai a Lucca well, mai. I mean, you know, if you think about the great sort of uh, example of a successful writer of science fiction it's Evangelisti who uh, Valerio Evangelisti who of mm-hmm. course you know uh, mixes it with historical fiction fantasy it's certainly not you know straight up science yes. fiction yeah it's not just like that's the way it is yes Well, thank you. I think Daniele reminded uh-huh. us that, uh, you know, as fascinating and stimulating a conversation uh, 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 this is, unfortunately, we have to uh, to, ha- to end it here. Uh, so I would like, again, to thank uh, uh, those who have made this possible, Daniele, Lucinda, Alessio, for uh, his introduction. And, of course, and most uh, uh, importantly, uh, Marco Arnaudo for sharing his... Uh, knowledge and virtually his extensive collection which i'm still you know looking at with with envy and lust i must admit i'm sure i'll go in in, in one of the uh one of the circles of hell that in the inferno <laughs> that you showed us i mean I'm sure there's a place of, uh, uh for me right there but um thank you again and i hope that this is a conversation that we can continue perhaps uh perhaps here maybe we can have a some other we can get you involved in some uh, other tix events uh, as we as we move forward and thank you all for uh for connecting and for participating thanks again marco and thank Buona, you for the pleasure bu- buon gioco sarà fatto thank okay. you for having me